Hi everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. Really glad you could join today. Today we'll be talking about something extremely important to our organizations, uh, one that is comparatively low tech compared to the buzz technologies of today like DevOps and Cloud. And this area of technology is often misunderstood by technology professionals despite being extremely relevant to each of us due to its fundamental nature in our day-to-day -day lives. And this area is storage, and architecting storage to get the most out of it, particularly from a performance standpoint. Now to introduce myself first, my name is Gene Tang. I'm a solutions architect at Rackspace Asia, where my role is to consult with clients and advise them technically about how to get the best out of the technology. I've been in this role for about five years, and before I became an architect, I worked directly hands-on with this technology over a period of 10 years as both a systems administrator and a virtualization engineer. Now covering off today's agenda, we'll start by setting the scene for storage, talking about the importance of storage to our organizations, and the challenges we face with regard to our growing reliance on storage today. We'll then chat about a few basics before I guide you through a step-by-step -step process that will allow you to immediately start thinking about your storage and how you can architect your storage to meet the needs of your organization right now. Finally, we'll talk about other approaches you can consider to further enhance your storage performance. Along with this presentation, there will be a technical handout that summarizes the presentation and a storage calculator that will assist with your storage calculation. So let's get started. Data is becoming the new raw material of business. Now this quote succinctly summarizes how our businesses operate today. In fact, in this day and age, the quote should really be, data is the new raw material of business, where our businesses not only rely on data to give us a competitive edge, but rely on data to fundamentally allow us to operate day to day. Now according to IDC, there will be about 8 zettabytes of data worldwide in 2015, growing to about 35 zettabytes of data in 2020, where a zettabyte translates to about 1 billion terabytes. And this rate of data, data growth is expected to be mirrored by almost all organizations, who will also expect that this data is stored persistently for use in things such as regulation, or for use to give us that competitive advantage. And this only emphasizes the importance of storage for us now and in the future. And with this growing reliance on storage from our businesses, this brings about challenges that we must overcome to ensure our businesses operate both competitively and effectively. And these challenges can be summarized into three key areas capacity and scalability challenges, integrity challenges, and performance challenges. Capacity and scalability challenges really pose the question of how many gigabytes of storage do I need now, and how do I grow that storage to meet future needs? Integrity challenges focus on how do I prevent data loss in the event of disk failure or data corruption? And storage performance challenges focus on how do I make sure that my storage can deliver the performance I need so my business can operate both effectively and keep my customers happy. And today we're going to touch on all these challenges, but we're going to put a bit more emphasis on that performance challenge. And this is because during most conversations I have, I find that people typically misunderstand storage performance and are often unable to articulate their performance needs, resulting in poorly performing storage that leads to loss of business productivity and potentially even loss of customers. So what is my goal here today? In a world where we're starting to move towards that as-a-service type cloud model, where the detail of hardware is being abstracted away, and hardware design is starting to become a bit of a lost art, my goal is to educate you to ensure that you can succinctly talk about storage and ensure that you can architect your storage to meet your business needs whether that be in your own data center or hosted externally. One thing to bear in mind, though, is that storage architecture is an extremely complicated subject area. And as a result, through this presentation, I will make a number of generalizations to make it more consumable. 
But if there is any doubt or you feel that your storage requirement is advanced enough to be beyond the scope of this presentation, I really encourage you to reach out to your solutions architect or storage vendor so they can put together an appropriate design for you. Now before we delve into the world of storage architecture, I do want to talk about some basics to make sure that everyone's on the same page. And the first thing I want to talk about is your mechanical disks. Now a mechanical hard disk stores data, that is your ones and zeros, on a spinning platter that's magnetized. These platters spin at a rate of up to 15,000 RPM or rounds per minute. An actuator assembly moves the read-write arm above the platter to read or write data off that platter. The elements that affect storage performance on a hard disk are firstly the rotational speed of the spindle. Naturally, if it's spinning faster, then the section of data will reach the read-write arm faster. Also, the time taken for the actuator to move the read-write read arm into position also affects performance. In its entirety, reading or writing data takes a few milliseconds. But in the world of computers, where things are usually measured in nanoseconds, this is a significant amount of time. And this is why mechanical disks are generally considered a performance bottleneck. Now one thing further to mention is that the most common types of mechanical disks today are your SAS and SATA disks. SAS disks tend to be more reliable and better performing and therefore are considered server grade, whereas SATA disks tend to be focused towards the consumer market. Next you have your solar state drive or SSD. Now SSDs use electrical signals to alter transistors that actually store the data on the disk. SSDs do have a reputation of being extremely fast, and generally speaking, they are a lot faster than your mechanical disks. They're also more reliable because they generate less heat and use less power. But on the flip side, they can be very expensive. Now a few key points about the use of SSDs. SSDs are really fast at random operations, but for operations which are hugely sequential, such as workloads that read large files, you may actually find that mechanical disks can be faster since they're optimized for sequential workloads. Also, sustained writes to an SSD can slow it down significantly, far slower than a mechanical disk, and this is largely due to the internal garbage collection process that occurs within an SSD software. So if you have an application that is constantly writing to disk, then SSDs may not be a good fit. Now RAID is the last basic knowledge piece we'll cover off before we start going through our architecture steps. RAID is an acronym that stands for Redundant Array of Independent or Inexpensive Disks. It has two main functions, and those are to group disks together in such a way that we can firstly improve overall performance by parallelizing disk operations across a number of disks, and secondly, improve data redundancy by preventing data loss in the event of a disk failure. Now RAID does consist of a number of mathematical formulas and algorithms, but we're not going to go into this level of detail in today's presentation. Instead, I've summarized the different RAID levels into the table shown in the slide. Each RAID level represents a different configuration of striping, mirroring, or parity to achieve the previous goal stated, but to varying degrees. That is to say that each level has a different effect on redundancy and performance, with some RAID levels being more redundant, so for example RAID 6, and some RAID levels being better performing, so for example RAID 10. One thing I do want to highlight is RAID always improves read performance but write performance depends on the write penalty of the RAID level. Now write penalty defines the number of extra operations that need to be performed when you initiate a single write. So in the case of RAID 10, for every single write that I ask the RAID system to do, it needs to run two additional disk operations. Comparatively, RAID 5 has a write penalty of 4, meaning that in the case of write performance, RAID 10 is roughly two times better than RAID 5. Now let's get on to architecting some storage. The first step of the process is to understand the storage type we need. This step is important because put simply, 
depending on the storage type we've chosen, we may not have to go through the process of architecting the storage in the first place. For example, if you decided that you would like to use some cloud-based storage and the application can support that, then usually the storage is delivered as a service and you won't need to go through any architecture steps around that storage. Now, boil down to the most basic level, there are three categories of storage. Firstly, block storage. If you've ever used a SAM, a storage area network, or a DAS, directly attached storage, or even the local hard drive of your computer, then you've seen block storage. Block storage is simply a disk presented to you in your computer that you can use in any way that you want. Typically, you'd add a file system over top of it to make it usable. Next, you have your network file storage, or NFS. The easiest way to think about network file storage is your office here. It's a centralized storage location that exists somewhere on the network, usually identified by an IP address. Now, an NFS device is typically any device running on a network file share protocol or running a network file share protocol, such as SMB or NFS. Lastly, you have your object or cloud storage. Now, this type of storage tends to be a paradigm shift away from your traditional storage, where data is categorized and organized based on its metadata. There is no folder hierarchy like you would have with your traditional storage types. So if I store my data in object-based storage, everything is at one level, and it's identified by metadata tags that provide further information about it. If, for example, I want to search all data associated with my holiday, I may simply search metadata tags for holiday details to get data about that holiday. Now you've got a better idea of the storage type. What, what you'll tend to find is the next steps or the steps that I talk about today will work really well for block storage devices and network file storage devices like your SANs, DASs, NASs, and the local disks of your servers. For object or cloud storage, you'll tend to find that they're often delivered as a service by a cloud provider like Rackspace. And the architecture of such storage is generally beyond the scope of this presentation. The second step in our process is to start putting some numbers around our storage needs so we have something concrete to, to architect towards. This does mean putting numbers around our storage capacity requirements and our storage performance requirements. So how do we go about getting these numbers? Getting storage capacity numbers is pretty straightforward. For existing applications, we simply log onto the server and look at the usage and add the capacity requirements together. So this means, for example, looking at my computer and Windows or running the DF commands in Linux to get the numbers for you. We should also factor in a, a growth factor for our new storage system so we don't have to re-architect shortly after implementing. If, on the other hand, you're deploying a new application where you have no devices to check, the best approach is to estimate your, uh, based on your expected growth plans and potentially refer to vendor documentation. It also does help to use scalable storage devices like a SAN or virtualization where unexpected storage can be provisioned quickly and easily, often without any downtime. Now, storage performance is generally harder to quantify. This is because everyone's use case and use of applications differ. So we need to utilize tools on our specific systems to measure our specific performance needs. Now, there's a number of tools out there. Some are better than others. But on the next slide, I will introduce you to two which are probably the most accessible. Now, bear in mind, for existing applications, we should use these tools on production systems and measure over a period of 30 days at different times, including peak periods. This is to ensure accuracy of our storage performance metrics. With new and unknown applications, it's best to do the same monitoring but during indicative load tests. Alternatively, one can go refer to vendor documentation and best practices that can go a long way towards predicting performance requirements. Now, the tools I'm going to introduce you to are Perfmon for Windows and IOSAT for Linux. I've chosen these largely because they're native to the operating system. 
Now, I won't go into too much detail about these tools since there is extensive documentation on the Internet about them. But I'm going to highlight important counters, and I've also included the run commands so you can get yourself up and running. I'm also going to introduce you to the performance, storage performance metric I'm going to use. Now, there are many storage performance metrics, such as throughput and queue length, and not all storage performance metrics are relevant depending on scenario and use case. In fact, using the wrong metric can often throw you off completely. However, based on my experience, and this is very much a generalization, there is one metric that is very relevant for the most common workloads I see customers run. And this metric is input output operations per second, or IOTS for short. IOTS measures the number of operations a storage system can handle per second. The larger the number, the greater the performance requirement. Now there are a number of factors that affect IOPS, such as block size, but in the interest of keeping things simple, we're not going to factor this in. Now going back to our tools, Windows PerfMod has a counter disk reads per second, which measures the read IOPS. It also has another counter disk writes per second, which measures write IOPS. Separating the IOPS into read and write is important for our calculations, so do keep this in mind. I've also shown some other counters which may be relevant for different scenarios. Similarly, IOSTAT can be used to measure read and write IOPS as well. Now, I also did mention that you should run these tools over a period of time. Perfmon has functionality called data collectors, which can automate collection for you. And IOSTAT can be used in conjunction with CronTab and the dash R flag to write metrics out to files. Now step three, the, now the key behind storage architecture is that we should always optimize our storage for our applications. This means that we need to have a better understanding of the application IO characteristics of our applications so we can make informed choices over the RAID levels and disk choices we choose as each combination of characteristics will demand a different optimal configuration. Now these three key IO characteristics. Firstly, the read-write ratio, which defines whether our application is primarily reading data from disk or writing data to disk. For example, a data warehouse is more likely to read data from disk, whereas a log file of a database is primarily going to write data to disk. Now this is an important metric since as mentioned previously, Writing to disk is often an expensive operation, especially if a RAID is involved. The next I.O. characteristic is access type, and whether the access type is predominantly random or sequential in fashion. Random access means that when the application calls for data or sends data to the disk, that data is scattered randomly throughout the disk. Think of your transactional databases or your general purpose operating systems. Sequential access means that when the application calls for data or sends data to the disk, that data exists side by side one another. Think of your systems that use large files or an archiving system. And lastly, the last I characteristic is your I/O request size. I/O request size defines the average size of the data block sent to or from the disk. The application typically defines the I/O request size. So, for example, the default block size within SQL Server is 64 kilobytes, whereas in Exchange it's 32 kilobytes. So how do you go about finding the application I/O characteristics of your application? Now there's a couple of ways we can do this. Firstly, we could use profiling tools. Tools like Perfmon that have counters, can have counters that determine things like I/O average I/O size and read-write percentages. Alternatively, we can consult the de developers or vendor documentation. Developers or application support should have a really good idea of how their software interacts with the disks based on the code that they write or the best, what the best practices state. Similarly, vendor documentation can go quite far too. Using Microsoft Exchange as an example, it does have quite extensive documentation about things like default block sizes and access types. But to make things a bit simpler, I've put together a table as shown here which defines a typical application I/O characteristics for common applications. 
Now, this is, of course, is a generalization and does differ based on environment, but it does give a good starting point when nothing else is available. Now, let's get on to making some actual decisions about our storage architecture. Firstly, the choice of RAID level should always be based on our application IO characteristics. Choose the wrong RAID level, and this may cause performance problems down the line. Now, the detail around choosing the right RAID level is actually a very, very complicated subject. But to simplify it and make it more consumable, I provided a table to simplify that decision making. Simply match the application characteristics in the table and select the RAID type. If there is more than one choice of RAID, you may need to put some thought into which is the best one. For example, if there still is a relatively large proportion of writes, say, for example, 30%, then you may choose RAID 10 over RAID 5 simply to minimize that RAID write penalty. Bear in mind that if you are running multiple applications on the same storage system, you will need to compromise. However, ideally you'd like to, group, like to look to group similar applications together to optimize your storage. The next choice is around disk and disk technologies. As discussed previously, SSDs are really good at random workloads, particularly reads, whereas mechanical disks tend to do really well at sequential workloads and writes. The choice of disks should ideally be based on the application IO characteristics. However, factors such as price, as price and availability will always factor in. Finally, we bring this together by actually plugging our numbers and choices into some formulas. The first stage is to determine what our storage systems actually need to deliver in terms of capacity and performance, we can then tailor our storage architecture around these numbers. We determine the performance requirements using the formula at the top. It's a pretty straightforward formula. Only thing to highlight is that we factor in write penalty to the write IOPS figure, and then add this to the read IOPS to get our total IOPS requirements. Similarly, to determine our storage capacity requirements, we add the calculated storage capacity with the growth factor for, say, the next six months to a year, and this is shown by the bottom formula. The next step is to determine the number of disks we need to meet both the capacity and performance requirements. Looking at the table on the top left, we can determine the number of disks needed to meet our capacity requirements. Now, based on our disk choice, we simply divide the required capacity with the capacity of a single disk. This gives us the disk requirements without factoring RAID. We then factor in RAID and add the additional parity disks to get in C, or the disks needed to meet capacity requirements. For example, if we've chosen RAID 5, we would need to naturally add an additional parity disk. Calculating the numbers to meet our performance needs is a similar process. Looking at the formula and tables on the top right, we take the total required IOPS and divide by the IOPS delivered by a single disk to determine NP, or the total number of disks to meet the performance requirements. Before we move forward, we need to ensure that NP meets the rules of the chosen RAID, as shown by the table on the top right. For example, if I've chosen RAID 10, I need to ensure that the calculated value is an even number. If not, I must add an additional disk to ensure we meet the rules. Also, for simplicity, as each disk has different IOPS output, I've shown some industry standard IOPS figures for disks, which can be used in your calculations, where, for example, a 15,000 RPM SAS disk delivers around 180 IOPS. Now, lastly, looking at the formula in the middle, we need to take the two calculated values, NC and NT, and determine the largest of the two. This value represents the number of disks we need in our storage system to meet the capacity and performance requirements of our application. Now, the key here is also not to stop, but instead to iterate with different RAID types and disk choices so that you can make an informed decision over the best combination to meet your budgetary requirements and device requirements. Now, let's run through an example. The scenario is we have an existing SQL Server OLTP database. From our measurements with Perthmon, we found that we require 300 read IOPS and 150 write IOPS. This is about a 66% read and 33% write split. SQL Server is configured with the default 64 kilobyte IO block size, 
and we know the workload is very random. Our storage capacity currently is 200 gigabytes, and our forecast suggests that our data is going to grow by about 20% in the next 12 months. We don't want to have to deal with re-architecting our storage for the next 12 months, so we need to cater for this growth. In addition to this, we have six disk slots in our servers. And our vendor has mentioned they only have 146 gig, 15k SAS disks remaining in their inventory. So where do we start? We've got an application with small to medium I.O. size, primarily random workloads, and a majority read profile with a still a relatively high proportion of write operations. Now we're limited to 146 gig SAS drives, so we're constrained by that disk and that disk type. But in terms of RAID, we use the lookup table, and this states that we can either use RAID 10, 5, or 6. Now knowing we still have a good proportion of writes, and we definitely don't want any write degradation, we're going to select RAID 10 for this iteration. Now plugging our numbers into our formulas, our storage requirement is 240 gig factory and growth for the next year. Our performance requirement is 600 IOPS, bearing in mind that RAID 10 has a write penalty of 2. Knowing these numbers, how many disks do I need, knowing we're using 146 gig 15K SAS drives? In terms of capacity, 240 gig divided by 146 gig drives results in a need for two drives. Factoring in that we've chosen RAID 10 means we need to double our disks for, uh, disk for parity, resulting in a need for four disks to meet our capacity requirements. In terms of performance, 600 IOPS divided by 180 IOPS, um, which is the, the approximate amount of IOPS delivered by 15K SAS drive, suggests a need for four disks. As we are using RAID 10, we require a number that is even, so we don't need to make any changes with regard to the disk count. Finally, we need to determine the largest of the two values, which is four. This is a nice number since it fits within our server, which has six slots available. From here, we may choose to iterate, or just decide to stick with our decision. Now, although these calculations aren't particularly complicated, I'm sure we'd rather automate it. And as such, I've put together a nice spreadsheet shown here, which is called the storage calculator. Now, using the same examples, we input the figures. So 300 IOPS for the read IOPS, 150 IOPS for the write IOPS, storage capacity requirement, which is 240 gigabytes, 200 gigabytes, sorry, with the 20% growth factor. And we know that the application is also SQL Server. And we are also constrained by 146 gig SAS drives. As you can see from the bottom calculation located here, we require four disks, the same that we calculated in the previous calculation. Now this slide takes a tangent away from architecting storage and gives you some insight in how we can further improve storage performance. After all, the goal is to improve storage performance to allow the business to run more effectively and keep our customers happy. There are a number of hardware and software enhancements we can make to speed things up, some which will give massive performance improvements, again depending on scenario. But a common thread among all of them is they use a form of caching or tri-limit disk access in the first place. This is because disks are fundamentally slow. Now a few hardware enhancements include using hardware-based RAID instead of software-based RAID. Similarly, using RAID caching can also yield quite good performance loop improvements. Caching using SSDs and Fusion IO cards can also yield quite good improvements as well. Software enhancements include optimizing the application code and database queries to minimize disk operations or using in-memory caching applications such as Varnish or Memcache. So this brings us to a close. Storage is a really complex topic that is often misunderstood, particularly in regard to storage performance. But even putting a bit of planning into the design of our storage can go a long way towards preventing problems in the future, ultimately allowing us to focus on our time on things that matter. Today, I've put together a number of steps that can help guide us through the complexities of architecting our storage. 
following these steps will start you down the right track towards ensuring that you and your business can cope with the challenges that data storage can bring. Thank you very much for listening, and if you do have any questions, please do write them in the chat box and I'll be happy to answer them for you.